Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Jeremy Roberson. I'm going to talk today about reconfigurable DSPs. Jeremy, when you think about DSPs, they've always been reconfigurable to a point. What's changed? So there's been two large application areas. One is for DSP and a device with a very, very specific and fixed function that needed a lot of PPA. And to handle that application, traditionally, ASICs were made for that particular target. The remaining DSP applications were not as intensive in terms of power, performance, and area, and full configurability was desirable. So you had DSP processors, which were like CPUs, but had a little extra instructions in order to handle the DSP focus of the algorithms. And this goes a lot further, right? Yeah, this goes a lot further where now you can combine the best of both worlds because more applications that used to be very fixed function, very high performance in these devices, now they want to have more flexibility and more intelligence than they have in the past. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Jeremy, what are we looking at? Yeah, so what we're looking at here in this picture is we're looking at an architecture diagram of an open RAN communication system. So this is a 5G and beyond 5G system. What's interesting about this system is that this is a description of how the architecture has been opened up. So you see a splitting between three major parts of the communication network. You have your front hall, your mid hall, your back hall. And what you see here of interest is that there's a big software block on each one of these. So what's happening is that there's a bigger focus on software early on, and they're pushing more intelligence to each one of these nodes, which is different than the previous generations. Um, moreover than that, you see a dividing line going through the middle of the diagram, separating the hardware vendors to the south and the software vendors above it. And what this means is that they want to have general purpose enough programming hardware so that software vendors can come in, add that intelligence, and add that flexibility. And the hardware guys can just focus on what they do best, which is the hardware. So what's the implications of that? So the implications of doing that partitioning is that you need to have all the flexibility to allow software vendors to go in and innovate but you still need that high performance, especially in the front hall part of the network, which is this radio unit over to the far left. This is really the beginning of 6G here, right? Is this what you're talking about? Yeah, this is the architecture plan for the later evolution stages of 5G, but in particular 6G. And one of the big differences when you get into 6G is we tend to think about 5G in terms of just the handset that we've been using for a long time. That's not necessarily the model that we're talking about here, right? This is now a massive movement of data, but not necessarily just to your, your phone. Yeah, so the, the way that data is handled is handled in a way where more intelligence can be injected at every single part of the system, not just the handsets, but the base stations and these other types of uh, devices that help facilitate the movement of information. On top of that, not only are our phones going to be connected, but we're going to have a wider proliferation of this communication technology, for instance, IoT. So now IoT-enabled devices will also have connectivity. You've got a lot of data that's moving through here. In addition to that, you have a lot more applications than you ever had before. You're trying to take this data and say, okay, this needs to be managed all the way across from the DSP into the system, into whatever the system of systems happens to be. How do you do that? So the way that we accomplish that is we come up with a whole new architecture that takes that into consideration. Tell me about this architecture. What's different here? Yeah, so there's a lot of things different about this architecture. So if you look at this architecture, there's two distinctive features. You see the big blocks in red, and you see this central block in the middle in yellow. The blocks in red you can think of as your traditional ASIC. So it's hardwired, fixed function style hardware blocks for DSP. There's matrix multiplication blocks, but there's also other blocks that handle the other types of tasks that, need, that are needed to perform DSP. Those particular blocks perform with the same or similar PPA as your ASIC. In addition to that, though, there's EFPGA fabric in the middle. And the EFPGA fabric's job is to manage the flow of data in a very flexible way. And when you combine these things together, you're able to get the performance of the ASIC for the matrix multiplication and all the other heavy intensive computational tasks, but you get the flexibility overall 
because you're able to route things flexibly using the FPGA. But that's not all. There's more flexibility than that. One of the problems here is that you, you typically trade off flexibility with power. How do you manage that? Because obviously power is very important as you get into these devices. So most of the power is being consumed in the matrix multiplication operations, and those particular operations are hardwired so that we maintain the power advantage of the ASIC. You've got a lot of options here. What can you do with that flexibility? Yeah, so one of the major areas of flexibility for DSP is the amount of computation you need in your form factor. So if you're an IoT device, power might be your biggest constraint, and you might not need a lot of computation and processing power. So to handle that application, you will use a single tile of this IP, and you'll be able to meet the performance needs within your power envelope. However, if you're an automotive, if you're an automobile, and you've got a lot more power, but a tons of more computation that you need to handle, then you can handle two tiles, four tiles, or up to eight tiles of this IP in order to meet your performance. Another concern when you start getting into automotive and some of the mission critical applications is precision and accuracy. What happens here and how does this, this architecture affect that? Yeah, so this architecture is designed to hit all application areas and some applications such as communication systems, it's well known that you can have pretty low precision and have almost no impact to the net overall user experience. If you're doing something much higher precision like automotive, biomedical, uh, or precision instrumentation, in that, sense, in that sense, every bit of precision absolutely matters. How much reconfiguration possibility is there when you start dealing with different use cases, different applications? Yeah, that's a great question. So applications change on the fly, which is something that hasn't been done as much in the past. So if you, for example, say you have a smartphone and you have a camera and you're in a very low light condition, and now you need to run a specific algorithm in order to handle that low light condition. Well, now you're changing into a different mode. This type of architecture is perfect for that because it allows very fast reconfigurability. You can have one set of DSP functions at one time, and then when a certain event happens, like low light, within a microsecond, you can switch over and go to a completely different application. And if you th look at your, your own phone, you've got so many different applications that are updating all the time, and, and you used to have maybe one or two that would update here and there. Uh, now, almost every day, you look at your phone and say, okay, this, this now has 15 new applications that need to be updated. This will address some of that and will do it automatically? It will do that. So it, because the hardware itself is reconfigurable, whenever you have a new application, you can use over-the-air programming or whatever type of facility that device uh, allows, and you can put a different bitstream or image into the phone so that you can use it. You've talked in general about DSPs. Let's drill down a little bit. What happens in terms of the actual design, performance, uh, whatever you're going to adjust on the DSP? Yeah. So every single application, when we say DSP, usually boils down to a, a few specific DSP building blocks. And uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. So what you see on this slide here is you see multiple, very common, very popular DSP tasks that are broken down and the performance is itemized, both for a single tile of the IP, but also for the eight tile version of the IP. And one of the things that really jumps out when I first saw the performance was that when you have eight tiles, you're able to do an FFT operation. And these are large FFT dimensions. You're taking a frequency transform with 1,000 points, 2,000 points, up to 4,000 points. And you're able to do that on the fly at 68 giga samples per second with an architecture that's fully flexible. And these numbers were unheard of um, you know, a few years back at this level of flexibility. On top of that, another very impressive feature is that very few hardware architectures are able to do matrix inversions. Matrix inversion is a pretty complex mathematical operation. We can handle that flexibly. And for this, we have a 32 by 32 matrix, which is a pretty large, a pretty common uh, size matrix for the telecom applications. And we're able to do 2.5, 2.8 million inversions per second. And if you're someone who's in that industry, you know that that number is extremely impressive. So how do you actually get the performance out of this to really ratchet it up? How does the software play in here? Yeah, so the software is designed where the end user does not have to have any knowledge of our architecture or how to program it. 
So let me show you precisely what I mean. So in this high-level diagram, what you have at the very top is a description of the application. A lot of DSP designers design their algorithms in a software called Simulink. And we can take that entire Simulink model with all the building blocks. And the plan is to provide a compiler where we analyze the Simulink diagram automatically, figure out how to program our chip directly, and we will come up with the actual bit streams and load them onto the chip so the user doesn't have to do anything. There are a lot of libraries out there for DSPs already that people are using. Will they still be used in the future and what will change? Hey, you're right. There are a lot of libraries that are used to enable DSP functions. And to start, we also have a full suite of libraries for the DSP functions as well that people can use and integrate into their solution. However, that's only the first start. We have a whole vision of heterogeneous compute where some applications will run on our Infrex IP, some will run off our chip. So in the future, we're looking at this much more holistically where we're optimizing not just one block in one library call, but the whole entire system optimized together. But to start, there's individual libraries that can be invoked. So basically what you're doing here is developing the platform and saying, okay, this stuff will change, but on the software level, because it's much faster to change it that way. Correct. Jeremy Robertson, thanks for a great explanation. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.